Okay, so we're gonna reflect on why and how to do Eucharistic adoration. Some initial thoughts why it's good to do Eucharistic adoration and then more precisely and more importantly, how to do um, the holy hour every week, or even if it's a holy hour, some elements of Eucharistic adoration. So why to do Eucharistic adoration? Well, in the first time, because we believe that Jesus is really present you know, in the most holy Eucharist. So if we truly believe that, like we need to spend time before him. You know? If we truly believe that the Eucharist is the, the presence of Christ, well, we need to spend time with him. Um, so that will be a first kind of easy reason why uh, we do Eucharistic adoration because we believe that the host is not only like a host but contains the totality of Christ. <clears throat> and in the Gospels, you see that people, when they had faith in the person of Christ, they wanted to be with Him. No, like at emails, they said, Stay with us, Lord, for it is late. They saw something in that man walking with them and they wanted to stay with them or mary magdalene when she says rabboni and she says mary and she's he says mary and she says rabboni she wants to hold to him no and he wants to she wants to stay with him no or the possessed man who is delivered from many demons in the gospel of mark he, the gospel says he wanted to stay with Jesus. So when someone believes who Christ is and someone realizes the love of Christ, well, you want to be with him. This kind of a magnetism of the person of Christ. And well, that happens and that is... Um, kind of made effective, especially in Eucharistic adoration. There's many ways of presence of Christ, no? Like the Lord is present in, in, in the word of God, is present in the community, is present in the events that happen to us, is present in, uh, in creation in some way as well, is present in the soul, but the eminent presence I don't know how you say it in, in English. In Spanish, it's la presencia por antonomasia. The presence by the eminent presence is a real presence. It's a, of all, all the seven sacraments, it's, it's, it's the only presence that stays even after the sacrament is performed. Like baptism, the grace of God flows through the water, but does not stay in the water. The same with the oil in the anointing of a sick, but in the Eucharistic presence after the Mass, that presence remains. And that gives us the opportunity to stay and, and contemplate that sacrament that is the most special sacrament. So that's one first reason why we should do Eucharistic adoration. The second one is that it's a source of transformation. When we adore Christ, like that really transforms us. And um, it's like the analogy of the sun, no? When you kind of sunbathe. Give me a second, I'm gonna mute because there's some. Okay. So when you um, spend time in Eucharistic adoration, well, that, that's transforming. It's like spending time in the sun. Maybe you don't realize, but the sun begins to change a little by little. And I think this is very true. And that's why I would say most of the saints, they spend a lot of time in Eucharistic adoration. When you think of the Cure of Ars, Padre Pio, Madre, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, with the Holy Hour, um, when you think of um, Catherine of Siena, well, the list is infinite. <laughs> all, all the saints they spend time with, 
with the Northern Eucharistic Adoration. The third reason is that Jesus asks us to stay with him in prayer. In Matthew 26, when he goes in the agony, he goes to pray in the agony of the garden, he says to the three disciples, stay here while I go and pray. I, I did a kind of a more precise reading of the passages where he says that. And it's interesting that he did not say, come and pray with me. He said, come here, stay awake while I go and pray. And then when they fall asleep, he comes back and says, couldn't you stay awake one hour? So the intention of Christ is that they um, do vigil with him. Basically, Jesus is praying in the agony of the garden for the world and he's gaining strength to drink the chalice and do the will of the Father. And he wants the company of, of his friends. But it's not that he asks them to pray. He asks them just to stay awake and make him give him company. So when we do Eucharistic adoration, we also join that prayer of Jesus to the Father. Sorry, people keep coming to the waiting room, I need to admit them. Um, so when we do Eucharistic adoration, that's what is happening, no? Like Jesus is praying to the Father, is praying for the world, and we make him company like those three disciples. The fourth reason to do, or why we do Eucharistic adoration is because it gives you a higher perspective. You gain like heavenly perspective. When you have like a, the chance to every week pray one hour before the Blessed Sacrament, well, it's like a table experience. So it's like going to the mountain with Jesus and in a sense, seeing the world from new lenses, seeing your life from new lenses. And in a sense, the invisible world becomes more real for us. No, Like the world is very real, no? like the world of the senses. That's why we need the Eucharistic adoration is an experience of, of table where heaven becomes more real, the invisible world becomes more real. So adoration also is a source of strengthening of your faith and your deeper conviction in the invisible world. The, I think it's fifth reason why to do adoration is because it is a source of peace. When we do more Eucharistic adoration, it makes a more peaceful person or a less anxious person. And I think this is something that the world is going to need more and more. Like, um, like, I know that some, we have psychologists and people who treat anxiety. Well, I would tell the doctors, like, <laughs> why don't you recommend one hour of Eucharistic adoration every week? That would be better than many pills and other things, no? So when you adore the Lord, one, your heart begins to be more centered on Christ. Two, the Lord begins to live in you and that's a source of inner peace. Usually people who spend time in Eucharistic adoration, they kind of emanate a, a special sense of peace. And I think one of the reasons why we find peace when we pray is that we realize that there is someone greater than us. So you can rely or you can kind of lean on someone else. Like the spirit of adoration makes you realize that like you are not the center of the universe and God is the center and God is in charge. So when you do adoration, you kind of recenter all the the right priorities, no, and 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 that can kind of gives you inner peace. Um, and that's why it's important. One of the beauties of praying one hour is that it's not so easy to attain that inner peace. Sometimes it takes a lot of time of quieting down the soul, and that's why praying for a longer time, well, at least once a week, gives you that chance of entering into that spirit of peace. And the last reason to why we do adoration is because this is an idea of Pope Benedict. But basically, 
like there's an interconnection between adoration and the participation at mass. The more you do Eucharistic adoration, the better then you will participate the mass. And then the more you, the better you participate on the mass, then the more you will do Eucharistic adoration. So it's kind of a virtuous cycle, no? Like in adoration, we contemplate what happened at mass. We deepen the experience of mass. And then adoration kind of prepares or enhances our participation at mass. Something similar happens with Lexio Divina and the liturgy of the word. The more you do Lexio Divina on a daily basis, you meditate with the daily gospel, the more then you are able to participate on the liturgy of the word at mass. And the more you do Eucharistic adoration, well, the more fruitful your communions will become. So this is, I think, in Sacramentus Caritatis in the document on the Eucharist by Pope Benedict, but he's one of the, the popes that kind of spoke of this interconnection between adoration and mass. So those are some initial reasons why it's good to do Eucharistic adoration. One, um, Jesus is really present there and friendship demands time and adoration leads to a deeper intimacy with Christ. Two, it's a source of transformation. The saints were transformed by the Eucharist because they spent time before the Lord in, in adoration. Three, because we accompany Jesus in his prayer for the world. Four, because we need to gain higher perspective and, and a heavenly perspective and be more convicted of the invisible world. Five is a source of peace and six, it enhances our um, participation at mass. So how to do Eucharistic adoration? First of all, like the vision of the kind of one hour of adoration is kind of the vision of having a weekly retreat, like set apart in your schedule, like one whole hour of prayer. Um, it's kind of an appointment with Jesus or a meeting with Jesus or a date with Jesus, if you will, however you prefer to call it, a date, appointment, schedule, meeting, um, or a coffee with Jesus. Not that you should drink coffee in the, for the Blessed Sacrament, but it's kind of a time to say, this time is for the Lord. And during that time, I, I, I will be completely devoted to him. He will be completely devoted to me. Like, it's a very special opportunity you have and it's good to set in the schedule because we tend to um, prioritize our things so having a commitment in adoration every week is, is a great way to do it this does not mean that you cannot pray in other moments no like and this does not mean that you cannot pray before the blessed sacrament if the blessed sacrament is not exposed you can also pray the church is open and there are many other adoration chapels in the city and many tabernacles, although not many churches open the doors. I think that's a very a big mistake. Um, I think the churches should be open. And actually, Pope Francis in Evangelicadium, he says churches should be open. Like, even if it makes a place less secure or people can steal things, churches should be open. Put the security measures and the more people, the more you leave the church open, the more people come and the less safe, the more safe the place becomes because it's more visited. So that's kind of the vision, a weekly hour where you have a kind of a small retreat with the Lord. Um, and before anything I say, like, this is not set in stone. I'm going to share some tips of how to do the holy hour, but you can take some elements, you can um take them all you can take none i i don't say this is the only method I, i'm just gonna share like some things that work for me and i i try in sanction society last year we decided to try to do a holy hour every day you no know? like uh, we used to do 30 minutes but we see that there's a moment that we need to pray more and honestly it uh, has been such a blessing you no know? And I'm glad that for me, it, it was commanded. <laughs> it was a requirement, so it was very good. I don't do it every day, and sometimes 
I shorten it and well, but I need to fight for it. Mm -hmm. So seven short tips of how to do the holy hour. And again, I don't wanna say this is the only way. And actually I'm gonna recommend at the end, the talk by Fulton Shin, how to do a holy hour. And he says something similar, like I, I don't think I have any advice. If I could say one advice, he says is read the Bible before the blessed sacrament. He says, that's the only advice I will give. Um, Anyway, so seven tips. Tip number one, do the genuflection well. Your holy hour, in a sense, begins in the way you do the genuflection. So your faith in the real presence should be expressed and strengthened in the way we do the genuflection. You know, the word genu means knee flexion to bend. So we begin the holy hour with a small gesture of prayer and act of faith in the real presence by doing a genuflection. Second, do what many of the saints, especially St. Alfonso Ligori recommend, and is start the holy hour doing what we call an act of spiritual communion. In the prayer, in the prayer book of the Ascension Society, that by the way, we have a new version that I will make available for you. This has spiritual communion but it's very simple is we say blessed and worship be the most holy sacrament of the altar now and forever glory be to the father and to the son and to the holy and then three times and then this a prayer of spiritual communion that now that we are doing online mass this tradition that has been forever has become more known how to do an act of spiritual communion but this is a short prayer that says Lord Jesus, I firmly believe you are present in the most holy sacrament of the altar. I adore you as true God here hidden. For my sins, I ask your forgiveness. And because I love you above all things, I desire to receive you spiritually in this moment. And there you kind of welcome Christ in your heart. You try to unite your will and your mind to him. And then you say, now that I have been united to you, I give you thanks and totally surrender to your holy will. And then you can pray the anima Christi, soul of Christ, sanctify me, body of Christ, save me, blood of Christ, inebriate me, and then all the anima Christi. By the way, don't you think that that's beautiful, that that's kind of a point of communion with the Protestant tradition, like the Protestants, they say, okay, welcome Jesus in your heart. Well, we have been doing that forever through the act of spiritual communion, no? Um, so that's an initial prayer that is good to do in the beginning. It kind of begins to make you more aware of the presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Um, then the third tip is to enter into God's presence. Like we are before an amazing reality, you know, that is the presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And that's an objective reality, but we need to make a subjective, like kind of enter into spiritual communion with that reality of, of the presence of Christ. So the first, I don't have one thing, but these are some things that you can do to become more aware that Christ is there. One, you can repeat the name of Christ and your name. You can say Jesus, Ignacio, Jesus, Ignacio. It's kind of a tennis match or a ping pong, no? Like that way is kind of helps you make the, 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 the prayer more personal, helps you kind of realize that adoration is a connection of two persons, not of like you're before a real person, no? And so. And it helps you also connect your own heart with the heart of Jesus. So that's one way to enter the presence of God. Another thing is to read something like, like you can read, for example, a, a, like a prayer written by the saints. You can, I, I something that I started doing this series to always take a short book, but more, 
a devotional book, for example, you can take the Imitation of Christ of Kempis and you read one page or two pages of not, not, not a long reading, just a, a reading that kind of gives you a spiritual fervor. Or you can read, for example, The Practice of the Love of Jesus Christ by San Alfonso Ligori. And again, one, one short section, not the whole chapter. Or this is a book by Newman that is more like um, called Meditations and Devotions. And me, uh, the section three is all prayers that he wrote before the Blessed Sacrament. And they are very beautiful. Very beautiful prayers. You can, um, the Insenu Yesu is a prior revelation that became kind of very famous, written by, I, I think it's an, I don't know if it's an Irish monk, but also it's very good. So you can read a short text. You shouldn't read too much before the Blessed Sacrament. You shouldn't kind of read 30 minutes or 40 minutes of a book. You can do spiritual reading, but if you're praying before the Blessed Sacrament, Blessed Sacrament is good to pray. And the same with the Rosary. I would not recommend to pray the Rosary before the Blessed Sacrament. It's good to pray the Rosary and and maybe you can go to pray the rosary and the blessed sacrament exposed. It's not that it's a sin to pray the rosary. But if you are praying before the Lord in the Eucharist, well, it's better to be focused more on that. Um, another thing you can do to enter into the presence of Christ is just to do acts of faith. You know, like say spontaneously, Jesus, I believe you are here, my Lord and my God. Um, Brooke shared once that she he says titles of Christ, no, like Lamb of God, Adonai, Emmanuel. He just say who Jesus is. It's not that he doesn't know <laughs> and you are reminding him. It's that you don't know or we forget and we're just reminding ourselves. Mm? Um, you can read a psalm. So that's the second step if you want, like um, to enter the presence of God to warm up. The tip number four is to um, review your week. This is what we could call vital prayer. Is to pray with your calendar. So I have, um, I'm in the old school. <laughs> I have my paper calendar. <laughs> so I, I, on Mondays, when I do adoration, I, what I do is I I go and I look from my last Monday and I kind of go through the week more with that perspective of totality. So I, I, I look at the events that happened, the people I met. And well, then I begin to pray with those things. And you can either kind of count your blessings you can see where was the presence of God in that last week. Something that I started doing recently and has been very useful um, is to ask three questions. What did I learn from God in this week? What did I learn from others? And what did I learn from myself, about myself? Those three questions are very practical to review your week. You kind of review your week thinking of those three questions and it can help you kind of begin to learn more about, um, about yourself, about the Lord and about others. No? Like, so for example, what I learned about others, well, how was I edified by the actions of others or or I learned that people need to be listened or whatever, like through the things that happen, you kind of take some wisdom of life. In that way, you kind of unite your life and your prayer. And in that way, you kind of recapitulate your week in Christ. And also you learn to gain wisdom with what things that happen in your life. So these are kind of all warming up exercises, no? the, spirit, the spiritual communion, then entering to the presence of God, then reviewing your week, 
none of them I have a high expectation of a mystical experience hmm? or a contemplative experience. But then tip number five is now what we could call the main theme of the holy hour. Like it's good to have to bring a topic or something you are going to do. So these are some things you can do for the main theme or the body of the prayer. One is you can pray more attentively with, with like a scripture passage. For example, you can take a, one of the chapters of the Bible and, and read with it and pray with it. You can say John 15, Luke 15, Romans 8, John 6, to do a, a slow read of the Bible. You can pray maybe with the Sunday readings in anticipation or in follow-up. Let's say last Sunday we pray on, on, on diligence. Well, usually we give homework and a, a reading. Well, in that time you can kind of go back to the Sunday message and pray with it. You can pray with a specific theme that came up either in confession or spiritual direction. I say, okay, like, I don't know, I say I need to work on joy. Well, why, I'm gonna pray about this. Or I need to work on reconciliation. I'm gonna pray about this. No? So you can bring a specific theme that you feel you can speak with Jesus about. Um, you can also just speak with Jesus about your life, like things that concern you, questions you have. Um, yes, you can be more spontaneous in that moment of, of prayer. One form that you can use is a typical acts form, no? Adoration, contrition, thanksgiving, supplication. Adoration, contrition, thanksgiving, and supplication. Another thing you can you can do is um, Bini Flynn has a book called 20, 21 Ways of Worship. And each has 21 exercises you can do. So that's another thing you can do. Take one a week and, and do it slowly. Um, and then, well, now, in, like after being a while praying, well, it's good to enter a, a, like a spirit of silence, and adoration, not all has to be like doing things all the time, but I think at first it's good to warm up the heart, kind of get the ball rolling. And then it's when you begin to kind of connect more heart to heart with Jesus. Um, sometimes it happens more in a more in a deeper way, or sometimes it's, it's more, maybe you feel less, no? Um, so that's not up to you. And, and then, well, tip number six will be you can do intercession also. You can have a prayer list and just pray for people. Like I have like in my spiritual journal, I, I have like a prayer list of people and well, I, I pray and sometimes just say the name without much kind of mystical experience i just say like okay like for monica for susie for Arthur, i just throw them there into the eucharist um and then the final thing the tip number seven is to finish like more if you want like praising god and surrendering to him um yes like kind of towards the end of adoration it's good to Thank Jesus for who he is, for this time of prayer. Kind of join the adoration of the angels and the saints. You can ask the saints to ask you to help you worship him. Kind of take your eyes out of you and put them on him. And also to do a prayer of surrender. Like just, okay, Lord, I entrust you this week that is coming up. I entrust you the things that are going on. I give my life to you and well, thank you for being this hour with you. And now I wanna be your instrument in this world. I, I surrender to you. Um, well, those are the, the basic tips I, I wanted to share. Like this structure can also be done 
on a daily basis if you want. If you do it on a daily basis, instead of reviewing your week, you could do an examination of conscience, a daily examination of conscience. Tip four was to review your week. Well, instead of doing that, you can review your day and do an examination of conscience. Um, and then, well, some resources that I, I, some books that I recommend and some videos that maybe you can use to deepen and then we can open to questions and comments. One, this a book called Visits to the Blessed Sacrament by San Alfonso Ligori. It has 30 short prayers to do before the Blessed Sacrament. Imitation of Christ, as I was saying. Meditations and Devotions by Newman. The book Jesus as Friend by Salvador Canals is very good to pray also in the beginning. Prayer for Beginners also has concrete ways of praying not necessarily before the Blessed Sacrament, by Peter Crift. Um, then 21 Ways of Worship by Benny Flynn. Then another thing you can do at some point is to read the section of the Catechism on the Real Presence. By the way, the Catechism is amazing. We need to read the Catechism. It's one of the best books, very succinct, it has the tradition of the church, the magisterium, the saints, and in a very brief way. Uh, and then there's a talk by Fulton Sheen, How to Do a Holy Hour, that also is very good. Let me see if I can share with you all those texts in the chat so you can copy them. While Father's doing that, um, Sister Teresa also has been making um, handouts basically every week that have, they have the um, spiritual